1 Corinthians chapter 8. Open up the Word of God. First, uh, we're going to hit the um, first 13 verses, which means we're hitting the entire chapter because there's only 13 verses. Um, and uh, so we're going to better tackle that today. Uh, why don't we go ahead and dive into the first six verses by reading it together. Will you please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God? If it's underlined, I'll let you read that portion of it. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Is knowledge also, the love itself. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven on earth, uh, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. You should be a little embarrassed. <laughs> that, let's do that again. We're going to start. I'm going to read it. Let's read it together. You know, you know when you're, you're teaching your kids to read and all of a sudden you're like, oh, let me, let's read that together. Um, let's, here we go. Ready? Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is very gracious to us, um, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. This is the word of God. You may be seated. God, help us to learn how to read. <laughs> little more context for you today. You have, especially in books like uh, Colossians and Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, understanding the, con all of it, but understanding the context is so very important. Temples of the day, we know that there are over 20 temples in Corinth. Paul's writing this from Ephesus to the people of Corinth. And we know that it was just full of sexual immorality and all types of things. But there, in temples, temples were the cultural centers of the day, okay? Uh, a lot of different things, they would come and they would socialize there. They would have food there. They would eat together. Um, truly a cultural center of sorts for people to come to the temple in that manner. And we know that Corinth was a Roman colony, knowing that it was a Roman colony, this imperial cult-like thing of being able to come into the temple was expected where they would offer meat. And so people would come there and um, not only make sacrifices, but offer meat as well at this community center of sorts. And they would buy, if you were buying meat of the day, you could buy meat really in two different places. You could go to what we would consider to be a butcher, right? You could go there or you can go to the temple. Why? Because people would come and make sacrifices at the temple. When someone would come and make a sacrifice at the temple, that sacrifice was broken up and cut up into three different sections. There was a section that was given to God, on behalf, to God, right, as, a, as an offering. There was a section that was given to the priest. And then there was a section that was often kept by the person making the sacrifice. All right? So here's this portion here. This is for you, God, we're making a sacrifice. Here's another part given to the priest and another part kept for them, the family. And you can imagine if you're the priest and there's a lot of sacrifices coming in, you can only eat so much meat. Imagine you can go to different countries today and you have the meat just hanging there and flies on it. You go, sure, I'll take a slab and you eat it. You just knock the flies off. It would have been no different then. They would just been hanging out. And so they would take that meat instead of it wasting, they'd sell it. Priests could make some, some good side money on this um, and they would be able to um, allow others to then have meat that maybe even that they would not have otherwise. And so it was common to buy meat, even if it was offered to a pagan God. And they would end up sometimes having an argument and there was somewhat of a disruption because people were, offer, uh, they were eating meat that was offered to a pagan God. And yet scripture tells us, it, it says beginning of chapter eight, where it says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know he, he, what he ought to know. For if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, right? And that there is no God but one. 
So he's like, hey, what's it? It doesn't really matter because we know that that's being offered to an idol that's not even real. So if you can eat the meat, eat the meat. But yet it was causing some people to stumble. And so there is this issue that was happening there within the believers in the Corinthian church. And so they ended up at draft. Paul addresses it very, very clearly. We're going to get in that in a second. One of the, one of the problems, though, is sometimes it's hard to, to know the difference between an essential and a non-essential. What, eating a meat that's offered to an idol that's not even real is a non-essential. But it's still important, but it's a non-essential. So it, you might even, I'm going to give you a list of essentials and a list of non-essentials. Because he's addressing non-essentials, I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of a cheat sheet. He's letting them know, listen, it's not just about you doing whatever you want. Sacrifice your rights in order to be a witness of Jesus Christ. And so if you're doing something that's a non-essential and it's going to disrupt someone else in their faith, just don't do it. Get over yourself. That's kind of what he's going to communicate. But it's a non-essential. I'll give you some essentials. Here's some essentials. The deity of Jesus Christ, that's an essential. The Trinity, Father, Son, that's an essential. Understanding the atonement brought by the death and the blood of Jesus Christ, now the tomb is empty. Understanding the power of the resurrection, that's a what? That's an essential. There are certain things that we have as essential. Salvation by faith alone, that's an essential. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough, but we have it through grace. Isn't that great? It's amazing. Grace and forgiveness and mercy that we have through the saving power of Christ. That's an essential that you believe that. That's an essential. But then we have non-essentials. And this was a non-essential. And so there was some confusion. We, we would even refer to it possibly as a gray area. Say, okay, what do we do here? I'll give you some gray areas um, that, that would be more culturally relevant for us. Dancing. Can you dance if you love Jesus? Heck yes. Now, some of you shouldn't because <laughs> you had the rhythm of a two by four, right? That's what we would say. Um, but there's a reality. So when I was growing up, even when, when, when I was growing up, if I wore this to preach in, I would be a product of Satan, truly, because I wasn't wearing a noose or a tie, whatever you want to call it, All right? that we made up not that long ago, right? So we have essentials and we have non-essentials. Non-essential also was, you know, back in the day um, would not only be the attire that you would wear, but did you know that if you water your grass on a Sunday, you can still go to heaven? <laughs> it's good news for you. Get on your app, go ahead and program it, turn it on. All right, but the reason that's important because we've made up rules. When you live by non-essentials, it's because you're trying to more securely hold on to your insecurities rather than living by the grace of Jesus Christ. Have I hit a nerve yet? So he's, here, here's, remember, Paul is writing back Chloe's house. First Corinthians chapter one is like, hey, listen, this, I know you came, you did a great work here, um, year and a half worth, and it was awesome, but there's some things, I mean, they're, they're, they're being led astray. These are still really young believers. And now they're even stepping in to like, they're judging each other based on, do you eat that meat? Do you not eat that meat? And he's like, it's not even about that. Give attention to the essentials because you need to understand your knowledge should lead to something different. In fact, the word to know or knowledge is used 12 times in 13 verses. One chapter, to know, to have knowledge, 12 times in 13 verses. He refers to the different idols here seven different times. And then not only on the seven times of the idols, but then he refers to other gods four more times, which would be an idol. Um, and so he refers to that. And he's referring to this knowledge and that this knowledge that they had at the very beginning of chapter eight, he's like, man, don't you know this, all of us possess knowledge? These quotations were added by the way, but I think pretty accurate. It says, don't you know that all of us possess knowledge? This knowledge puffs up. Knowledge is not, isn't to puff you up, right? Well, this knowledge, a, a greater knowledge of God leads to a greater love of others. This is a, a cheat sheet for you in terms of a theme. Our knowledge of God leads to a love for others. 
not a condescending posture. And some of you would just so badly want to be right. But yet we know that our primary goal is to be what? Righteous. And so if your, if your knowledge of God doesn't lead to a greater knowledge of how you should love others and care for them and reflect Christ in the decisions that you make every single day, there's, a, there's an issue here. Another way of thinking about this is that exercising a right to a preference, like eating food offered to idols, exercising a right to a preference never outweighs demonstrating the love of Christ. And so if you have something that's a non-essential, that's a preference, that isn't a biblical conviction, those are different. You got to know the difference between essentials and non-essentials. And so if you have a non-essential and all of a sudden that desire is outweighing your desire to then love others and to reveal the love and the power and the mercy and the grace, the forgiveness of Christ, you've got a massive problem on your hands because now you're the one who is worshiping an idol. So don't let that get in the way. Paul is recognizing this and this knowledge, this information that you have, it should lead to greater transformation. Not for you to be pompous and puffed up and look at how smart you are. You're, the greater you know God, the greater you should have a desire to love people who are broken without God so that they would know transformation themselves so that for all of eternity, they would worship the creator. A greater knowledge of God doesn't cause you to stand back from the world. It causes you to have a greater tenacity to step into the world, to reveal to them the power of the cross. It's not for you to isolate yourself. It's so that you can impact the people around you. And so if you're doing something that is a non-essential in your life and it's going to cause them to stumble, just stop doing it. Because as a believer, guess what? You no longer have any rights. Because what you have said is I'm going to give all authority to God in heaven. It's the Lord's prayer. Thy will be done. Whatever he desires for my life, I'm in. But yet so many of us today, what have we done? We've made up our own rules and we've already predetermined what our life needs to look like. And if it doesn't look like that, then we, we get angry at God. And yet when you said yes to Jesus, what you were saying, whether you know this or not, but biblically is that you have said the great commandment. I will love the Lord of my God with all of my heart, my, all of my mind, soul, and strength. Anything he says goes. It's his life. This body is not my own. My heart is not my own. My mind is not my own. Everything belongs to him, whatever he desires. So when you grow up and go, hey, this is what I've got to live. This is what my kids are going to do. They're going to have grandkids. This is last week. By the time they're 23, if, they're, if it's after that, I'm going to have to beat them up. And then you're going, to have, you're going to have this property and you're going to be able to have this cottage. You're going to do this, this, and this. And when things don't go the way you want them, you get upset with God. And yet I thought you surrendered everything to him. What? If you have said yes to Jesus, all of you belongs to Jesus. Every preference, every right. And so he's saying this knowledge that you have of who Christ is, it's caused you to be puffed up and you're starting to judge others because they're not doing things that are non-essentials and you're struggling with this. You have given up your rights to Jesus as a believer, which means your life should now be shaped by Jesus. Nothing else. And one of the issues that you're seeing here is people, we, we begin living our lives according to the size of our God. And what the world is seeing is that our God is way too small. And he's going, don't do this. You're giving all your energy and all your attention to the wrong things here. The reality is if it's not an essential, just relax a little bit and live according to my will. Reflect me. Friends, knowledge doesn't remove our responsibility to love God and others. Knowledge doesn't remove our responsibility to love God and love others. This is an issue of preference, not conviction. Right? We have to focus on the areas of conviction, not preference. And yet they're focusing on the preference. They're focusing on non-essential and they're judging people and they're, they're having conflict over it. They're slugging it out. I, I mean, I've told the story before, but I, I remember being at one church and there was a wall that was purple. 
And it was like, there's, there's some colors purple, they're cool. Other color purple, not so much. And it was, I'm like, we, can we paint that? That's like the main, can we paint that? And they're like, no, 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 no. Because somebody painted that thing in 1712. And they, like, I'm like, that's not an essential, but it could help to, like, it doesn't match anything. You've painted everything but that wall because some person painted it. Can we paint the thing? And man, these people were devoted to that purple wall. And, and we can think that's being funny, but sometimes we get just as devoted to something that's a non-essential. I and mean, we can get upset about it too. Then in verse six, there he is, he's calling all this out. He's like, in verse five, let me go back to there. For, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, there is one God. So there's just one God, we know that. So all these idols and all, or all this meets me and sacrifice the things that aren't even real. So who cares? But at the same time, if it's gonna cause somebody else to stumble, relax and just give it up. It says there's one God, the father from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I love this because uh, Paul is incredibly knowledgeable. He's an edu educated individual. In the Old Testament, you have something called the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, all right? So you have something called the Shema and this reminds me, he, he uses, he doesn't, this isn't the full Shema by any means, but it reminds me because of the Shema and then he incorporates Jesus Christ into it. He says this, right? He says, and there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, to whom are all things and through whom we exist. And so he calls this out and he lets him know, this is all about Jesus. This is all about Jesus. So he looks at it. And then verse seven and following, he says, look at verse seven and I'll show, show you here on the screen. However, not all possess this knowledge not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to a, as an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Five times he uses and refers to people being weak. Food, he just says, they, they don't have this knowledge. And he says, verse eight, food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat it and no better off if we do. It's not about the meat. It's about your witness. That's what that means. It's not about the meat. You're, listen, if you eat it, you're no worse off, you're no better off, but it is about your witness. If it's not gonna help your witness, you would be, and you love Jesus, you're eager to give up anything that is gonna get in the way of somebody else encountering and seeing the power of Jesus. You'd be eager to. Remember, you gave up your rights, remember? When you said yes to Christ, you go, man, I know I can't earn salvation. And remember, that's an essential salvation through faith alone. I know that by faith in Jesus Christ, he has saved me and that his death paid the price for that sin that, uh, in my life. And as a result of that, I've given up my life to him because I choose to, you choose to do that. It's a it's choice that you have made. And in doing such, you should have given up all of your rights and all of your preferences, all of your non-essentials, right? So you're doing that. And he's going, don't you understand? Food's not gonna commend us to God. You're not gonna be any worse off or better off. But verse nine, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the, re to the weak. Yeah, you have, listen, he already said earlier in this book that just simply because something is permissible doesn't mean that it's beneficial. Can you do it? You can do it. But why would you do it if it's gonna cause somebody else to stumble because they don't have the knowledge that you have. So just don't do it, right? I know we grew up in this culture and it's like, you, everybody says, you can't tell me what, what's to say? You can't tell me what to do. You gave that up when you said yes to Jesus Christ, friends. You gave that up when you said yes to Jesus Christ. We don't like that. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? 
Just know this, if people know that you're a believer and they see you doing something, then they may do it and it may lead them astray. Listen, I've got friends and others that are alcoholics and maybe some of you are an alcoholic or you know someone. Guess what you don't do with an alcoholic? Take them to a, yeah, that's just cold. That's just being a jerk, right? I mean, like you recognize it and you go, we're not gonna do that. Why would you do that? So why would you do anything? Right? You've given up your rights. Why would you do anything that's cause, gonna cause somebody else to stumble in that way? Just don't do it. Because if you're really a witness of Jesus Christ, whatever you're doing, they're going to look at that and go, well, hey, maybe they are more knowledgeable than I am, so I should behave in the same manner. And they're not able to handle it in the same way that you can handle it. So you just don't do it. You gave up your rights. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for, for whom Christ died, yet you're leading them astray. That's what it's communicating in verse uh, 11. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. When you do that, guess what you do? What's it say? Right there, it says, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, what do you do? You sin against Christ. Oh, that just brought it, that's real. When you're unwilling to give up your non-essentials in order to be surrendered to Christ and you're causing somebody else to stumble, then you're sinning against Christ himself. Like, oh, yeah, I need to, re, I need to rethink my posturing. I need to rethink who I am and what I'm willing to do and what I'm not willing to do. And if it's an essential or if it's not an essential, if it's a preference or if it's a deep biblical conviction, there are certain things I'm going to do no matter what because it's a deep, deep biblical conviction. It's in the word of God. I've got to live that out. But if it's just a preference, I have to be willing to evaluate whether or not that's impacting others in a good manner, if it's drawing them closer to God or not. So it's not really about food. It's about where you have found fulfillment. And if you're being a, a witness to who Christ is, See, some of these Corinthians who are believers, they started to think that they were superior to others. They were more spiritual. But it's sinful for a believer to exercise their rights in a way that harms a fellow believer. Why would you do this? Therefore, if food, therefore, he just he summarized this entire portion. He says, therefore. If food makes my brother stumble, I'll never eat meat. Lest I make my brother stumble. I know we don't like this because it means we have to evaluate things about based on how it impacts other people, simply understanding the impact that it can have and not only evaluating our own preferences. It's something called Christian liberty. Christian liberty is freedom from the bondage of sin, but it's not freedom to do whatever you desire. And so what liberties, what preferences, what non-essentials are in your life that you need to give up, right? I, even, listen, even some things, they're not, they're not wrong in amongst themselves, but even things that are a part of our daily routine can sometimes become idols. And we need to surrender those things. If we don't get to do certain things that are non-essentials, man, we can get really ornery, right? Because those things have a place in our heart and they've become too important to us. What is that for you? What are those liberties that you need to say, oh, you know what? I don't know if that's the best way to go. What is it for you? Remember, when Paul got to Corinth, there's no knowledge of Christ and he was teaching them for a year and a half and then he went away and he's getting this news and he's writing them back. 
And he's trying to help them understand, don't you know that Jesus is everything? And as a result, you should be willing to sacrifice everything. You can't claim to live for Christ and then still live according to the ways of the world. And yet they were holding on to these ideas and it was leading others astray. What do you need to surrender? What are the preferences that you need to give up? God, I thank you that we get to worship you, praise you, declare you. It's a pretty simple message, God. We belong to you now. (laughs) And so sometimes we need to surrender our preferences things that we think are essential. We need to sometimes surrender our pride and our arrogance and recognize, just as you have stated in this letter over and over, we were bought with a price. We were bought with a price. God, may we be dominated by nothing but you. Amen.